Hi, this is uh, John Mack, and uh, on behalf of the SIA Investment Trends Committee, I want to welcome you to our uh, annual webinar on the state of the finance business as it relates to the security industry. So, uh, Ron, if you'll move me forward a page here. Uh, in, as part of my introduction, I'm the uh, Executive Vice President of Imperial Capital. I head up our investment banking team and uh, uh, oversee the security practice. Imperial Capital is a 250-person investment bank uh, with a big focus in the security industry. So moving right into the agenda, thanks, uh, uh, Ron. We, um, I have a quick overview of the SI Investment Trends Committee for you here. Uh, I'll hit this pretty quickly. For those of you who've been on these webinars before, you've seen this before, so this is obviously for those who haven't heard about it. Um, our goal is to increase availability of security industry information um, related to the capital markets, M&A, uh, and information relevant to investors who might be looking to participate or are participating in the industry. And so you can see the elements that that includes. I don't have to read all of them, but uh, clearly the webinar is what we're involved in doing now. Uh, we have put out periodic reports. Um, we have worked on creating a special category within SIA for uh, the investment community to become members of SIA and get access to information. And we're going to be more active at the two big events that the SIA holds every year, the ISC show in Las Vegas and uh, securing new ground in, uh, in the fall in New York. Uh, and then uh, this year we're going to be launching our uh, annual awards for, uh, for executives in the finance side, M&A and finance side of the industry. Uh, and Alfred Shisingak, one of our members, will be uh, spearheading that effort, so we'll, uh, we'll go after that as well. Uh, we're obviously targeting members who come from the finance community, and you can see the founding members of the committee uh, are listed there below, uh, several of whom are going to be on the call. Uh, here uh, this afternoon. So moving forward, the uh, speaker bios, uh, clearly I'm not going to read through these. Uh, you just heard a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to lead off the discussion here with a section uh, on covering M&A and, and some investment activity. Albert Shatingak from Raymond James will follow me with some similar material, but we've coordinated our slides so that his will cover different facets of the industry and kind of a different macro look at the trends uh, from the finance perspective, so hopefully that'll be helpful. Uh, will Schmidt will uh, will cover what's going on in the debt markets. Uh, will is the capital source. And then Franklin McClelland, uh, who's the Vice President of Strategy and BizDev at uh, Legion, will talk about what's going on in the market from a strategic acquirer's perspective within the uh, security industry. So we thought you'd find that uh, th this mix uh, reasonably good. And then we're, uh, we're hoping today to leave 10 to 15 minutes for questions. When we did our last webinar, there was a lot of uh, requests to, to have questions answered as part of this. So we're hoping to leave 10 to 15 minutes to, uh, to do just that. So um, if I keep moving at a, at a good pace here, we should be able to do that and we'll, we'll ask the rest of the participants to do the same thing. So let's move right into it. Um, my intention is to uh, to cover what's happening in security M&A and key trends that have uh, an implication for the financing and, and mergers and acquisitions part of the industry. So Ron, you can go ahead and jump right into my first slide. Thank you. Um, this is the macro view. For those of you who know Imperial Capital, we've been doing this tr the chart. Uh, Jeff Kessler uh, on the research side, and I've been promoting it as part of our banking practice, where we're just tracking broadly three sectors in the industry. The physical security sector, everything from video to guards to alarm systems. Identity solution sector, which is covering um, access and biometrics and things relevant to identity. And, and then, of course, information security, which would be network security and cybersecurity. So those three sectors are highlighted here. You can see there was a pretty good spike in activity in 2013, and it's stabilized since then. There's good solid activity, but nothing particularly notable about the volume of transactions in 2015. Next slide. Then I dive into each one of the sections here just very quickly, and this is just designed to give a trend-like overview, so I'm not going to go into to, uh, much discussion on each of these slides. But on the physical security sector, you can see we've broken it into physical security services and physical security products. 
Um, and it's pretty well balanced, and the ratio between products and services remains the same. Um, and as I said earlier, the level of activity in physical security is emblematic of the entire sector, which is that it's, it's pretty good, solid activity. By historical trends, uh, we saw more activity in the beginning of 2015 and late 14, and then of course we had a bigger spike in 2013. Next slide, please. Identity solutions isn't as well tracked, uh, but again, we break it into services and products. Uh, not as easy to go find other reports that will track these transactions. We go through some specialty work to do that. Uh, and you can see that this is an area where I think we're going to continue to see this trend up. Again, 2013 um, had a lot of transaction activity, but it's building back up in the identity sector, and, and we're seeing a lot more uh, relevance and in, in, in the convergence between logical security and physical security. Identity solutions are real key. Uh, the fact that you've got a, uh, a biometric access point for your iPhone is a, is a good example of, of a trend that, that is across a uh, big part of what's going on here. Next slide. So the last one is cybersecurity. This has certainly been getting a lot of press because it's in the news all the time. Um, we saw the big wave of cyber deals happen in 2013, and then over the last year and a half, we've seen a number of IPOs of, uh, of companies in the cyberspace. Uh, the M&A activity has tailed off to some degree, in part because there's been a lot of consolidation that's gone on in this sector. But with the fall off in the equity markets, um, we believe we're going to see a, a bigger trend for consolidation happening this year as companies have a harder time accessing the IPO market. The trend for consolidation, the bigger, larger acquirers in the market, the Cisco's and IBM's of the world, the HP's are going to have a better chance to, to get active in the M&A market again. So I think we'll see this trend uh, pick up. And of course, the fundamental drivers of this industry sector are very, very strong. So next slide, please. We, uh, we figured we had to put this into the webinar because this, uh, this happened only two days ago and we imagine that a lot of you uh, on the call are interested in this transaction. It's one of the largest transactions ever in the physical security industry or in the in security industry broadly um, with ADT being a, an announcement by Apollo and Protection One that uh, they're going to acquire ADT. So that announcement just came out uh, two days ago on uh, Tuesday, and we can see that they're proposing to pay $42 per share, a $6.9 billion transaction value, equity transaction value, a 50% premium to ADT's closing price. The stock that ADT has fallen off pretty significantly to around $27 a share. Um, and uh, the, the total enterprise value translates to uh, a little over $12.2 billion. Uh, so again, a very significant transaction. Uh, under the terms of this deal, um, the uh, Protection One is actually the acquiring entity, and Tim Wall, uh, who many of us know from being around the industry for years, uh, will assume the leadership role at ADT. Uh, and Tim used to be at ADT, so this is coming back home for him at, at some level. Um, and uh, you can see that the pro forma RMR for the combined business will be about $318 million in RMR, which is uh, is very impressive, of course. Uh, the financing for that transaction is a uh, $4.7 billion in first lien and second lien debt and $750 million of new preferred equity actually coming in from a fund run by the uh, the Koch brothers uh, family office. So interesting to see there they, these high net worth family offices more involved in, in large transactions these days. And then lastly, you can see the, the key metrics. Uh, everybody's going to have slightly different variations of these, but we believe this is very close to what the metrics translate to. At $42 per share, this represents a, um, a transaction value of approximately 44 times RMR, just under 7 times EBITDA, and, and a little over 13 times steady state net operating cash flow. And that steady state net operating cash flow uh, defined the way that, that ADT calculates it. There's a lot of different people in the industry who calculate steady state net operating cash flow differently. Um, so that's going to account for that difference. Um, the, um, the next uh, slide here is, is talking to physical security trends. 
Um, I, I'm just going to read the bar at the top to give you a flavor for this because it really kind of makes the point. The convergence of video access and intrusion technologies have led to the emergence of a comprehensive physical security solutions with significant customer flexibility. Uh, people are no longer looking at putting in point solutions that have limited interactive ability to talk to each other. So the trend of having these complete solutions in a lot of different ways is becoming the, one of the more preeminent trends in the industry. Um, and then just quickly touching on a few subtrends within alarm monitoring, the whole notion of the convergence there is home automation, energy management, lighting, video, uh, connected door locks, and other capabilities coming together. We're seeing that both in the professional market and in the DIY market. Why market. Security integration uh, increasingly involving integrating uh, the management of, of networks and security of networks in addition to the traditional physical security infrastructure. Uh, and then more focus on verticalization, highly specialized solutions within specific industries. Um, I'm going to talk more about video surveillance at the end of this section, so you'll hear me touch on this in more significant way, but many trends happening in video surveillance that's driving the growth in that sector uh, and the emergence of solution selling. Guard services are increasingly looking to, uh, to integrate with uh, physical security integration offerings. Alper and his section is going to focus on that, so I won't take more up on that, but, but there's a bunch of very interesting trends that are going to drive uh, capital and M&A activity in, in the industry for some time. Within, and next slide please, within cyber, I mean we could do our own webinar on cyber alone, so it's well, virtually impossible to touch on this in one slide, but just as a macro, you know, it's a $75 billion plus subsector. Um, the, uh, the variety of breaches happening in government, healthcare, uh, entertainment, and, and industry in general are just stunning uh, every day and on a very substantial level. I, I think where it starts to become interesting and where it crosses over to the traditional physical security world and makes it relevant uh, to, the, to that sector is that we're seeing the cyber attacks including, increasingly involve into the mobile devices and into the cloud and into the Internet of Things. So as the traditional physical security of the uh, business increasingly focuses on an Internet of Things kind of business model and cloud-based business models and moving access to information to mobile devices, the notion of focusing on cybersecurity solutions for physical security applications is going to become a much bigger deal. Um, when we think about the propriety of information on the security side, um, having bad guys having access to that information is, is clearly going to be a very high priority. Next slide, please. So diving into the core uh, focus, I had an update on cloud-based uh, security market trends in the last webinar we did. So this is designed really as much as anything to be just a quick flyby update. Um, th this is one of the bigger overarching trends in the physical security world is the notion of moving to managed service offerings that are generally cloud-based uh, business models. Um, and so this is this is happening with what we're seeing in the, the nature of what's happening with residential and, and commercial alarm monitoring systems. Uh, it's happening with a proliferation of remote services, uh, video surveillance as a service, access control as a service, um, and, and a whole host of other things that are now being sold as a service. And emblematic of that is a number of transactions that happened in 2015. Uh, we were involved in the sale of Brevo to Dean Draco, uh, Eagle Eye Networks. Uh, Dean built one of the biggest managed services in the cybersecurity industry and with Barracuda Networks and believes the same opportunity exists to build a big managed service business with access and video in the physical security industry. Uh, one of his businesses, Eagle Eye Networks, uh, announced a, a partnership with Sureview to bring uh, more video-based or cloud-based video solutions to the market. Uh, a seminal transaction in the alarm monitoring sector with a business that has a significant cloud-based component to it, alarm.com, uh, going public at a very attractive valuation, uh, both uh, Imperial Capital, my firm, as well as uh, Raymond James Alper's firm were involved in that IPO. Uh, <clears throat> and it was exciting to see that, that evolution of the market. And then Alarm.com uh, is announcing that it's uh, got a ability to uh, interact with the cloud-based systems that uh, Amazon puts out, Echo, 
and the Apple TV infrastructure. So really interesting convergence with other sectors happening by virtue of this cloud-based business model. Uh, next slide. Um, the uh, the next is, is just showing, highlighting across different sectors, companies that are playing in this space. I'm not going to spend any time on it. I showed it before, so it's just by virtue of updating it. Um, so you can see across axis video alarm and integrators who's playing. And then lastly, I'm going to leave you with just a few minutes of highlights. If you can move the slide forward, Ron, one more for me. Um, the uh, One of the bigger trends happening in the industry right now is what's going on in video surveillance, uh, the, the market drivers, the capital that's being attracted to investing in this sector and the growth happening uh, throughout the world, frankly. Uh, IHS has this sector uh, growing to uh, just under $23 billion by 2019, uh, particularly fast growth at about a 10% growth rate and then particularly fast growth what's happening in consumer video surveillance uh, as well as this notion of video surveillance as a service are both very fast growing trends. Lots of things are driving this growth, certainly advances in technology that makes video far more productive. Um, so networking, uh, video management software improvements, cloud computing, better high definition cameras that can see more and do more, lower cost broadband and storage. There's a long list of technology advances making video more relevant applications in government, uh, education, the private sector, just overwhelming how many uh, fundamentally uh, strong applications are, applications that have a return on investment in addition to, by virtue of the functionality, in addition to traditional security applications. A huge transition with small to medium-sized businesses moving to more sophisticated network-based uh, video solutions is driving part of the market. Uh, and then a maturation of video analytics uh, is an important part of the story here as you're able to do more on an automated basis with analytics looking at the, the, uh, the images and being able to make, uh, take actionable, uh, you know, take actions based on those analytics, big trend. Uh, a lot to summarize in one page, but there are a lot of very strong drivers that we believe are going to attract capital and we're going to see a lot more M&A in this, in this sector. The next slide, if you can move forward one, Ron, is highlighting in more uh, significant uh, relief here of what's happening in the video surveillance as a service market. Uh, we, I believe you're going to see a huge part of video move to this managed service model, so it's not going to be businesses buying all kinds of infrastructure they're going to install and manage on their own. Companies are going to provision them, uh, their, their clients with video surveillance equipment and then manage it uh, and monitor it in many cases and, and a lot of that's going to be in the cloud. Big markets that are growing fast for the applications of video you can see in the bottom left hand side of the page. Um, certainly all the national accounts kind of businesses where remote management through video is a big deal um, you know, really stands out and then of course critical infrastructure, government, there's lots of places where this makes a lot of sense. And as I was saying earlier on the bottom right, there's a multiplicity of value propositions associated with, uh, with this market segment. Next page, please. The last page um, is the uh, just highlighting uh, a trend that Jeff Kessler and his reports from Imperial has highlighted, which is the horizontal collapse and consolidation in the video surveillance industry, which is essentially making the point that you're, you're seeing the point solution providers, people making disk cameras, making disk video management, making analytics uh, or other equipment are being bought up by firms that are looking to bring a solution to the market. So we were involved in selling DVTEL to FLIR. FLIR is clearly focused on this solution selling strategy and will continue to be acquisitive in the marketplace looking to build out uh, more depth to their, their, uh, their video solution. Panasonic uh, just bought Video Insight earlier this year. We were involved in representing Video Insight in that sale, and that's Panasonic looking to bring uh, the video management software to their traditional focus on the camera market, and they too will look to, to do more. The seminal transaction in this regard was Canon, first buying Milestone in the video management uh, surveillance space, the software side of the business, and then buying Access, the leading player on the camera side. So. The best example of this argument is what Canon has done with those two acquisitions. Uh, Vigilon could uh, could claim to really be the pioneer in this uh, sector with, with focus on selling a solution. 
uh, one of their more notable transactions in the last two years was uh, the video IQ uh, acquisition that uh, buying in the analytics, the beginning of their strategy to buy in uh, analytics and video management software capability. And then exact buying uh, or Tyco buying exact um, would have reinforced that same trend. Tyco traditionally making cameras and hardware is, is moving into the software side of the business with that exact acquisition. So lots of, of interesting activity here, and that's where I'm going to draw my part of the presentation to a conclusion. Uh, I've run a little long here, but uh, I get credit for sneaking in an extra slide on ADT. So that's, I'll take, that, that's what I'm going to blame my going two minutes long on. So Alper, I'm handing it off to you. Great. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, so just a quick introduction, Alpert Chasinger, Raymond James, I co-head the Security Defense and Government Services practice there and have been involved in the doing investment banking in the security industry for the last 15 years or so. Um, so similar to, to, to John, I'll, I'll cover a few high-level items, uh, stepping back all the way to, to the macro uh, factors in the equity markets and M&A, and then talk a bit more about some of the topics I discussed on the last call and then conclude with uh, a bit of depth around the guard services industry, the man guarding industry, which uh, is, is underseeing a lot or undergoing a lot of changes, as John noted. Um, next slide, please. So uh, you, you saw this, if you joined the last call, you saw this slide, and we'll continue to repeat it just to pr provide uh, folks with an, a view of the, the high level markets. Um, in the capital markets and the equity markets, you see this is really a view on 2015. Obviously, a lot has happened uh, even in the beginning of the year, but for 2015, uh, the descriptor here says stable, largely because you know, 2015 from beginning to end was somewhat of a wash, as you see, even with some of the volatility that occurred in terms of the major indices. Um, as I noted, the, the, the start of 2016 has been somewhat challenging, and, and everyone's watching with, with bated breath as to where the equity markets go, and, and certainly there's an impact on, uh, on the equity market performance on some of the, the M&A trends we're talking about, so we'll, we'll address that here in a minute. Bottom uh, portion of the page talks about the debt markets. Uh, Will Schmidt of CapSource will we'll talk a lot more about this, but just to provide you the last 10-year trends, you can see uh, 2013 and 2014 were really prolific years in terms of leveraged loan volume, which is really loans to support M&A transactions, and so that was a, a, a major element of, of the marketplace. And uh, and they were uh, those who were providing loans were also being very aggressive with respect to uh, the, the leverage levels at which they did so. Um, next slide, please. So this, this talks a little bit more about M&A volume, uh, which is a lot of what we do here in the security industry. Um, you know, the overwhelming majority, I think, of, of our work and certainly John's work uh, is around M&A. So uh, again, high level, uh, tremendous uh, year last year in M&A, certainly a rec record in the last decade, really a record uh, overall in history in terms of over tr roughly $2 uh, trillion dollars of, of M&A globally. Um, so very prolific year, and uh, in the bottom of the page also indicates that um, not only was it a prolific year, but, but valuations remained at, at very strong levels and even have really improved upon uh, where we saw values in 2014. Um, I point you to the right-hand side of the page, the, the blue and gray bars, those are denoting uh, the valuations paid by financial buyers, so you know, largely private equity funds uh, who are doing leverage buyouts and strategic buyers you'll see that uh, there was a there has been uh, a lot of activity on the part of the excuse me the financial buyer community and it's really driven activity in the last five years um, and, and they've been particularly aggressive the blue bars uh, in many cases outpacing uh, the gray bars in 2014 2015 is a slightly different story you saw the strategic buyers catch up and we certainly uh, experienced that in our activity, and uh, and we saw that generally in the marketplace. So strategic buyers definitely came back in in a more aggressive way in uh, in 2015. Next slide, please. So th this was a uh, a slide I showed the last time about uh, some of the market trends, and John addressed a number of these. What I thought I'd do is is quickly revisit those topics and provide any updates as to what's happened since we last convened. Um, you know, one of the trends was this notion of the, the disruptive next generation RMR models, and we see that across residential, commercial, video, PERS, really all of the sub-segments where uh, you see recurring revenue businesses. And I'd say that trend very much continues and, and has been re reinforced. 
Um, and I'll touch upon this in just a second, but moreover, in, in the last year, we think uh, we've seen uh, really a reaffirmation of security as the cornerstone of, of all things in automation. I call it automation, sort of the broadly capture the category uh, or categories we have listed here in the commentary. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, a very positive trend in our view for, for the industry. Uh, platform for managed services, again, uh, that's def definitely um, something we saw a lot of in 2015 and that we'll continue to see more of and, and M&A was used as a vehicle to, to facilitate this transition. Uh, we'll, we'll touch upon examples really most notably with Securitas, uh, which had made an investment in, in iVerify on the video monitoring side previously and then took a bolder step in acquiring Diebold's uh, security systems business, which has uh, a decent level of RMR uh, in, its, uh, in, in itself. Um, the competitive landscape, I don't, say, I don't think we changed, we saw too many changes necessarily um, last year in terms of new entrants, but we did see, I think, uh, uh, reinforcement of the fact that many of the larger players uh, are, are getting deeper into the space and making more commitments, and um, some of this is at uh, tail end of last year, I noted the Securitas Diebold transaction, even at the beginning of this year, uh, the merger between Johnson Controls and Tyco uh, to really sort of solidify the, uh, the security element of the overall building automation solution. So definitely a deepening there. And then institutional investment, I think there's a resounding positive in terms of the update. Uh, you saw many uh, firms, including uh, the, the transaction, the ADT Apollo transaction that John alluded to, uh, making substantial equity commitments into the industry. Uh, Warburg Pincus investing in universal services. Um, Wendell investing in Allied Barton, two, two transactions in the guarding space that I'll touch upon in, in a minute. Next slide, please. Uh, the specific industry I covered last time, or subsegment I covered last time, was smart home. And again, just to revisit the topics very quickly to give an update there. Um, on the trend side, we, we talked a lot about the conversion of connected devices from just pure automation to automation as a service and, and really um, incorporating the recurring revenue model. And, uh, and I think we could uh, definitely um, uh, affirm that that's, that's a trend that continues to take shape. We've seen a lot of product companies uh, developing recurring revenue models or in the early stages of doing so. Um, you know, for example, the drop cams of the world who have their monthly service for storage, et cetera. Uh, so that's a big, big part of the marketplace. Um, technology standards, again, um, we, we see companies like Alarm.com, as John alluded to, continuing to build their business and really develop, um, uh, serve as a platform for connecting into a very broad section of, uh, of, of third-party products. Uh, so, so positive trends there. System prices, um, I noted the example of DIY here as somewhat of a validation of this point. You are seeing some declines in system prices. DIY is certainly taking um, shape in, in more and more and uh, at the lower price points and, and the success of some of those companies is, is validation of, of this trend. And then you know, the introduction of new devices, I, I would say that has continued certainly, although one thing we've seen more recently is a bit more challenging environment for securing venture funding for, for some of these early stage businesses that are, uh, uh, that are trying to innovate in, in certain sub-segments of, of the automation world, so the smart home world. So overall, I think uh, positive trends for that marketplace and certainly more to come. Next slide, please. So a little bit of the deep dive um, uh, for this, this go around is on the guarding industry. And, and we picked this because the last year saw a lot of changes in the space. And, um, for an industry that's been around for a long period of time, uh, I think the structural changes in the marketplace uh, are, are pretty compelling and largely driven by technology, not surprisingly, uh, as well as um, unit economics and the desire to create an improving unit economic uh, structure for, for these businesses. So uh, I won't go into all the details of the industry. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with that. Um, but what we will, we will say is that um, you know, as, a, uh, as a result of, of these factors I noted, we did see a lot of changes and, and frankly, a lot of capital investment in the space. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the service portfolio, I think many of us associate the industry with probably the top two categories, uh, unarmed and armed guarding, but you'll see that it is actually fairly diverse already. And, uh, and if we look at this slide uh, probably next year or, or in the next few years, uh, it will become even more diverse. And, and at, the, at or near the top, you'll probably see security systems integration, video monitoring, 
background screening as, as other sor services being provided by companies in the space. Um, uh, and the key attribute here is that many of these companies at scale have extremely large customer bases and they have trusted relationships as the uh, security service provider, sort of the front line, if you will, of security um, in, in, in and around particularly the commercial marketplace. So as that trusted provider, uh, their ability to um, uh, provision other services and bring other services to bear to their customers is really the driver in creating revenue and enha enhancement uh, opportunities for these businesses. Next slide, please. So just to look at sizing, you know, in 2014, um, the, the estimate for the industry, or the, the, the actual size of the industry was roughly $30 billion. Um, it's, it's not a high growth market. Obviously, it's very large, so it's hard to grow at very rapid pace. But we do anticipate the pace to increase, uh, really, as a, num uh, as a result of a number of the factors I just mentioned to you. Um, historically, the one thing I'll point out that I didn't address on the previous slide, historically, this market has been really a uh, mid to high single digit cash flow margin industry um, and uh, and I think w the, the the goal certainly uh, is that with the addition of services and, and these revenue enhancement opportunities I mentioned you'll get much more flow through in terms of profitability and uh, and, and really build businesses more to a uh, low to mid uh, excuse me low to, to mid double digits type of margin sometime in the future so uh, clearly an opportunity to see some real economic expansion economic value expansion in, in these businesses next slide please um, trends so I, I've touched upon a number of them consolidation this is a highly highly fragmented industry so not surprisingly uh, of one of the core um, methods for growth is, is consolidation you'll see a lot of activity on the part of the larger players um, and some of which are very very prolific as, as probably the most notable example at least at least in the last few years would be uh, universal uh, services uh, which is which has been very active on the consolidation front um, private equity investment I already pointed this out but you've seen large-scale highly sophisticated uh, private equity investors making fairly large bets in the space um, Blackstone had, pre had previously bought Allied Barton. They recently exited in a very nice transaction to, to Wendell Group, uh, which is a uh, the family office of a, of a French conglomerate. Um, Warburg Pincus came in and, and acquired a majority interest in uh, in Universal in conjunction with Universal's acquisition of, of Guardsmark, which was another very large player in the space. And then you've had others like Goldman Sachs, Private Equity, Apex Partners, Carlyle, who have historically been in the space. So. Clearly, big commitments from from some very notable players, and, and we expect that to, to continue. Technology already mentioned uh, that this industry is is changing. I think uh, many of the, the progressive players in the space are trying to front run uh, some of the the competitive disruption that could occur as a result of video video monitoring, in particular, uh, in terms of guard replacement technologies. So uh, we see that to be a an important element of it, and you've seen. Um, activity, transaction activity, uh, either in the form of M&A or investments, drive some of that. And then I already mentioned the expansion of the, the service offering previously. Next slide, please. So um, structurally, again, I mentioned the market is, is highly, highly fragmented. This will give you the top 20 players. I think this is 2014, based on 2014 revenue with some pro forma for the, for the transactions I noted. The top five are, are meaningfully of a larger than, than the rest of the industry, so just to highlight the point about the scale at the top, and, uh, and, and we would expect those, those players to continue to, um, uh, to grow and scale uh, over time. And then the next slide, please. And really, just as a concluding point on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on the M&A side, um, we have seen a, a fairly prolific period here. Uh, with uh, with a number of large scale important transactions, uh, we think we will continue to see transactions not only within the space in terms of filling out geography or filling out uh, customer uh, vertical market uh, focus or customer focus for these organizations, but we will see uh, transactions that are diversifying uh, the service offering for many of these businesses. And so, um, stay tuned. But we expect that 2016 and beyond will, will also be a, a fairly active year in this space. And uh, with that, I'll conclude my section and turn it over to uh, Will Schmidt uh, at Capital Source. Great. Thanks, uh, Alper. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I have the pleasure of running the security lending practice for Capital Source. Uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to give these sort of presentations because it gives uh, 
me an opportunity to back away from the security bubble in which I spend most of my time and look at the industry more broadly. Uh, these sort of presentations over the last few years have almost gotten boring as we've uh, been talking about uh, plenty of capital availability, uh, very uh, advantageous rates, and, uh, and also very advantageous structures. Uh, unfortunately, today my comments will be a little more sober, um, but I'll do my best to, uh, to end on a positive note. Um, uh, this slide on the uh, first uh, or the first chart here uh, looks at the U.S. leveraged loan market broadly. This is the largest to mid-market. Uh, you'll see it tops out uh, in 13, as as was indicated on many of the other charts we looked at earlier, uh, and has been off sequentially since then. 15 da was down uh, to 783 billion, off 17 uh, percent. On the next slide. We take a look uh, at the non-banking market, the U.S. high-yield bonds and institutional loan market. And what we see here is high-yield bond volumes uh, off about 19% if you look at the last uh, four blue bars uh, in 15. But really, that doesn't tell the whole story. If you look at the second half of 15 versus the second half of 14, you see high-yield bond volume off 44%. And really, as we dig down in high-yield bonds, uh, what you're seeing uh, is a, a, an increasing spread related to the risk premium necessary. So as you compare high-yield bond uh, returns to treasuries, we're seeing a widening uh, demand by investors to hold these bonds. So if we go back to November 6th of last year, the, the uh, risk premium that people were receiving to hold high-yield non-investment-grade bonds was about 5.8%. Today, that has widened out uh, approximately 300 basis points to 8.5 to 8.8 percent, so a dramatic widening in a very, very short period uh, of time. Uh, on the same chart, you look at the, uh, the lighter bars, the uh, institutional loans, uh, down 35 percent in 15. A large portion of this is the CLO market, uh, which uh, at uh, 98 uh, billion in 15 uh, was off modestly but is off dramatically year-to-date uh, in 16 and expected to be less than half that volume for 16 uh, in total. On the next slide, uh, we really break down middle market loan issuances, and we focus on the middle market since this is where the majority of the security companies, certainly as you look, look at the like SDM 100, uh, the vast majority, probably below 10, the number 10 uh, borrower would be serviced by this market. So. Large middle market volume was off about 31%, and the traditional middle market was off about uh, 19% in, uh, in 15. On the, on the next slide, we just break this down a little bit further. Same charts, just, or same bars, just broken down to show what portion of each of these bars represented uh, refinances versus new money. And you can see uh, both were off uh, dramatically, or both were off, uh, you know, relatively uh, equal amounts, although the new money or M&A related financings were off uh, probably a little, uh, a little more. And I think this is really as a result of larger strategics uh, that had more balance sheet cash to deploy, probably winning a greater amount of the M&A uh, activity. So the, that activity was more clustered with larger uh, borrowers than necessarily middle market borrowers. On the next chart, we look at really the middle market sponsored LBO leverage. So looking at for sponsored deals, private equity backed deals in the middle market, what sort of leverage were these transactions uh, completed uh, at on the debt side? This is really a story of the have and have not uh, really in, in uh, kind of uh, specifically as we look at good deals getting full leverage versus uh, more marginal deals, either you know not getting done uh, at all or, or being pushed out of the market. Um, uh, the market has become increasingly more uh, disciplined and increasing as it, as it evaluates its transactions. Furthermore, we're also looking at the impact of the leverage lending guidance from the Federal Reserve impacting. Uh, leverage levels. And you think that would have a negative impact and, and drive them down, which it is as it relates to loans that are being financed by banks. 
But what we've seen is also non-banks stepping into the void and filling the space, and, and they're unrestrained by these, uh, these guidelines and are able to select uh, favorable transactions and leverage them at a higher level than, um, than traditionally. Uh, as we look forward to next year, I, there's, there's expectations that this is topped out and that leverage levels will retreat a bit in 16. As on the next chart, talking about uh, the structure of transactions in the middle market, this takes a look at the issuances of uh, covenant light transactions, so transactions with, with no covenant. Um, what you're seeing here is really as a result of regulatory pressure and banks' concerns over the economy, really a shift away from covenant light issuances, uh, you know, falling off you know, quarter over quarter uh, pretty dramatically in the second, third, and fourth quarter of 15, and with volume year to date uh, in 16 uh, off uh, dramatically as well. That's through uh, January, the last part is through January, so we would expect that to, to uh, equal uh, on that trend to equal about where we were in the fourth quarter of 15. So covenant light uh, definitely falling out of favor in the broader market. Um, on the next chart, uh, also looking at spreads, the senior spreads on uh, middle market transactions. You can see that as, as we look at the larger transactions, the spreads have fallen from uh, the third quarter from about 4.5% to uh, about, uh, I'm sorry, have increased from about 45 to about 4.85% uh, uh, over LIBOR, an increase of almost 40 bips. Um, but really on the, on the traditional, the smaller middle market deals, you see a much more dramatic rise with that increasing from 4.4% to 5.2%, uh, an 80 basis point increase. In summary on this you know, what, what I think you're seeing is really the broad market is generally reacting to concerns about the, uh, the growth in the economy and the potential for a recession. As we talked about, high yield bonds are up dramatically. That's often seen as a precursor to uh, economic contraction or recession. At, at an 8% spread, economists say that is prognosticating about a 60% likelihood of a recession. Uh, bank stocks are off dramatically. It's often seen uh, as a negative sign and a precursor to to, uh, to poor economic uh, times. Uh, in addition, I think there's you know broad concern about China, the uh, slowdown in China, and negative interest rates in Europe. And this also, uh, I would also say, energy prices and concerns are are factoring in as well. Uh, in general, debt providers uh, broadly are looking at are, are being much more circumspect. They're demanding higher returns, better structural protections, and cutting off access to some of the more marginal players in the market. And uh, you know, I don't expect we don't expect that this will be equally felt though, as as, uh, as seen on the slide that you're looking at here. I mean, the debt capital markets have, have usually been seen uh, as a resilient market and a, and a safe harbor in a storm. And as we look at what's happened in 15 and what's happened so far in 16, we see a, a number of favorable transactions. On the high yield side, Interface and Vivint were both able to uh, access the market on broadly syndicated loans. Apollo was twice in the market back with P1 and ASG. And uh, as announced here, you know, I believe has a fully underwritten package to, to complete the ADT transaction. Uh, rounding this out, uh, my alarm center successfully uh, improved the terms on on their junior capital, getting a second lien term loan done, and you know CSG also announced an increase to their uh, facility. As we looked at the smaller end of the market, it gets a little more murkier. There are a lot less transactions announced, a lot more confidentiality provisions in these deals. So, uh, what I can say is, you know, we have one that uh, you know Imperial. Uh, cap, the Toronto-based Imperial Capital got Ackerman done early in the year. There were several other, or, or many other facilities that were increased and uh, um, otherwise amended to support uh, acquisitions and growth in the market. And I think broadly speaking, lender, the Barnes the recent Barnes Conference was well attended by a number of lenders, I think looking at this industry as a place to deploy capital. Uh, on the last slide, I'll just uh, quickly touch, uh, touch base. This is a kind of scorecard I had last time, and this time it's a few more yellows, but I'd say volume, uh, mix, 
generally is low, but I think in the secure, this is actually kind of favorable as lenders will look to the security industry as a place to deploy capital. Biomix is a, you know, a non-factor structure. As we look forward in the year, people should expect less covenant light structures, more traditional uh, covenants in the deals that, uh, that are out there in the market that, uh, when they're seeking capital. I believe leverage in the security industry levels will stay about comparable to where they've been in the past, a, not, a no material decline uh, for, for good performing companies, and yields uh, are expected to modestly, uh, modestly broaden. Um, uh, in 2016. So overall, uh, capital available uh, with some slight uh, tightening around the margin. With that, uh, I will hand it over to uh, Franklin McClellan of Allegiant. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, so my, my intention here is to take a couple minutes to do three things. First, to introduce Allegiant to those of you who may not be super aware of who we are talk a little bit about our M&A strategy and approach, and then maybe a, a couple thoughts on 2016 and, and beyond for us in the M&A market. Next page, please. So who's Allegion? We are a uh, spinoff from Ingersoll Rand in late 2013, courtesy of an activist campaign from Nelson Peltz. We're traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and, and we're really on the other side of the security market relative to some of the other industries that, that uh, Alper and, and John talked about earlier in terms of alarms and guarding. I mean, we are a security products company. Uh, chances are you've touched one or multiple of our products today, brands by the name of Schlage, Von Duprin, LCN, Kryptonite, Bike Locks, Chisa out of Italy, Interflex out of Germany. Um, we serve both residential and non-residential markets. We are a, a branded commercial and residential products company. Um, we think we've got industry-leading EBITDA margins with uh, industry-leading growth, organic growth. This past year, we just announced earnings last week, organic revenue in excess of 5%, EBITDA north of 22% as a company. Next year, we're targeting uh, total growth in the seven to high single-digit range uh, before any incremental M&A. On top of that, for us, we, we're really a high cash generation business. We do target 100% of our net income to operating cash flow and that's possible with low working capital and low CapEx requirements. And as a result, that makes us uh, certainly interested in adding to our portfolio via M&A uh, with smart deals and so forth. So um, if I can go to the next page, just a snapshot of what we've done since we've spun off. You know, we our, our largest competitor is a company in Sweden who has done well over 100 deals in the last 10 years. And when we had spun off in late 2013, we had some, some catching up to do. And in the last two years, we've done several deals across all geographies, um, from the U.S. to Europe, Asia, Australia, and so forth. And, and really, we're focused on building out our global portfolio, um, sticking to our core, and really trying to, to build capabilities and, and benefit from macro trends. So a couple of quick examples from 2015. We had a, an interesting summer where we closed our three largest deals ever in the case in the in the course of a 45-day period. But first, to touch on a company some of you may have heard of by the name of Simons Voss. This is a pioneering electronic comp electronic locking company in Germany. Really strong margins, plug-and-play type products, with kind of a global we'll call it a German, Europe, and Asia presence. Um, and we we've been looking at this this asset for several years now, and finally the the situation came to a head last year. Um, very exciting times for us with uh, a way to really re rethink some of our technology capabilities. On top of that, there's a small deal in Korea we closed right around the same time called Milray. And this is a another electronic locking company focused on the residential space in Korea. And I raise these two issues as, as sort of evidence of how we think about M&A because it's not just buying good companies and buying interesting technologies. For us, it's really about connecting the dots between the companies and across our portfolio. So with, for example, with Simons Voss, they have a business in Singapore. Um, we recently sold our first Milray project via the Simons Voss Asia office. And this is evidence that we see about global platforms, global approaches. Um, the word used earlier in the presentation was about convergence. And that very much applies to our industry as well, where you have this concept of a mechanical lock and then embedding technology. Because at the end of the day, you still need the lock to work, but you want to 
embed that with remote access and electronics, cutting edge electronics. Next page, please. So one of the things that we have uh, stated publicly many times is our, our desire and our willingness to have a balanced and flexible capital allocation pro uh, uh, process. So we've got a, a stated leverage ratio of 275 to 325 debt to EBITDA. Given the deals we did last year where we closed the year at three and a half. But to be honest, we're very comfortable at that, at that level. Um, Will should have probably put our, our high yield bond offering on his page, but uh, we had a successful bond raise last year as well as a, a refi and an add to our bank facilities. Um, given our cash flows, we feel like we can support going higher than we are today if we have to, but also comfortable if the right deals aren't coming to fruition to reinvest in our business organically. Uh, or look at shareholder distribution through dividends or share repurchasing. So the point we, I, so the point I want to make here from an M&A perspective is it is a lever. It is a, a lever we'd like to exercise, but we're going to be really disciplined and focused. And if the right opportunities or the, or the values aren't there, we will look to do other things with our cash flow. Next page, please. So just quickly on our M&A platforms and thresholds, sort of a stock page, but we are focused on emerging markets emerging technologies and, and expanding our product portfolio. We want to stick to our core. We want to buy market leading businesses with ability to scale it, just as I mentioned earlier in my example of Simon's Voss, with clear synergy opportunities. We have a stated return on invested capital threshold that we try to meet on every deal. And, and we are taking the long view. I mean, we're not, we're not looking to do something quarter to quarter. We have a year three threshold for a very particular reason. So with the ups and downs in individual markets um, occurring and the volatility in the markets, we're still looking at long-term you know, security assets and, and the security platforms. Last but not least, in, ter in terms of our views on M&A for 2016 and beyond, you know, from my perspective, we really do have a strong platform of positions and brands. We, in many cases, the brands we own invented the category they're in. Um, so we have a strong franchise and therefore M&A becomes a, a nice to have. We think it's a growth strategy we could execute on. We've demonstrated that in our two years as a, as a standalone company. Uh, we're very comfortable and happy with the things we've done, but it's not something we must do. We're operating from a position of, of strength in that regards. On top of that, you know, for my, this is a personal philosophy, I want us to be the buyer of choice. I'm not interested in buying 25 companies a year. We're looking at the right companies with a clear strategy that, that we think we can add value to and vice versa. And so finally for us in, in terms of our pipeline, I think we, we feel like we have a good pipeline, but as I mentioned earlier, it's about having choices and flexibility. And so we are, are being, we're being aggressive, but at the same time being smart and making sure it's the right opportunity for us so we can deliver on our commitments to our shareholders. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about volatility in the capital markets. And I think the, the broader M&A market reflects that. But again, from a strategic perspective, because we've got a longer vantage point, we feel comfortable that there, there will be chances for us to, to make some investments and build some value. So that's it for me. I'd like to thank you all and, and turn it over back over to John for the last few minutes. Yeah, thank you, Franklin. Um, it's great to get the perspective of a strategic acquirer kind of counterbalanced against what you hear from uh, from uh, Alper and I talking about what's happening with private equity buyers. And in the past, we've had Andrew Dodson, who's on our committee from Parthenon, talking about the private equity perspective on acquisition. So we'll, we'll continue to try and keep that, uh, that mix of, of an appreciation of strategic and private equity. I, I look forward to finding a high quality company to, to sell to the Allegiant guys. That's a, that's a nice story about your, your appetites and, and uh, disciplined approach to doing deals. So uh, we, uh, we left time for questions, although we, uh, we all ran over, uh, which uh, probably should be suspected, but from a group like us that we would all take more time to, to deliver our message. Um, and so there's two things here. There's only, there's only one question. We may not have promoted the idea of being able to send in questions uh, ahead of time as well as we should have, so we'll try and get better at that next time and encourage questions maybe even in advance of the webinar so we, uh, we do our best to address them. Um, but um, we, and then the other thing I wanted to make the, the point, there were a number of people who did write in and say they wanted to get access to the presentation. Um, we will make the presentation available uh, from uh, Sia 
uh, Ron Hawkins at SEA will uh, will make sure that all the those of you who registered for the webinar today get a a PDF copy of a uh, link to a PDF copy. I suppose is what he's going to be doing to make that available to you. So that'll happen. And the one question we can entertain in our three minutes, Alper, is for you. It's a wonderful question about. Uh, the uh, do you expect to see robotics impacting the guard service industry in some way? So I'm going to leave that question to you. Wow, uh, I must say I, I don't think I've really thought about that one as much, uh, and so my my answer may not be particularly intelligent. But you know, today I'd say uh, it, it would be challenging to to envision that uh, to happen, and it sort of goes back to the statement I made earlier about you know the the long-standing relationships that a lot of these companies have with their customers and and the trusted relationship and I think there is um, uh, within that trusted relationship I think there's a, a lot uh, that is expected of you know having that physical presence um, uh, there with, with the guards and the assurance that that comes along with it um, uh, so I, I my, my visceral reaction is no not anytime soon although you know we are big fans of the automation trend and, and really all things automation and, and the improvements that come along with it. So um, so maybe we, we wait to see what happens there. And I'll just take this opportunity to draw an analog because it's a question we, we get a lot as it relates to home automation, for example, and, and the role of security. And, um, and and we continue to be believers, maybe just selfishly so, since we're, we're in this <laughs> in this space. Uh, but but security is really the cornerstone of of all these solutions. So when you think about the home security, or excuse me, the home automation marketplace, it's pretty rare that you see folks who are adopting um, smart home technologies without really having a, a security core, if you will. And uh, and I believe that that holds true not only in in the residential space but also in the commercial space, where you know you've got a big trend around building automation technologies, but nevertheless you still have very much of a core around security and and again I'll point to the, the Johnson Johnson Controls Tyco merger that happened uh, or that that was at least announced earlier this year uh, as a as a key uh, uh, validator of that point because uh, Tyco really brings that that security piece to the puzzle um, so we'll, we'll see but uh, but there's a lot I anticipate there to be a lot of changes within the overall automation world and so uh, I hope maybe I'm proven wrong on the robotics thing um, well, I think we can probably wrap up here. I, I would throw in one footnote for that, and I know it's an answer uh, Albert would have come to as well. But we, we cl I think the the, um, the the version of robotics is going to be remote video surveillance monitoring, and, and Albert was involved in bringing a remote video surveillance company to, to Securitas, I verify. Uh, we, we were involved in a transaction with West Tech, who's now part of Interface, and both of us have been around a number of remote video surveillance businesses. That is going to be the hybrid model for the guard industry, is using intelligent video and remote video surveillance as part of a hybrid guard, man guard, uh, and uh, an automation solution. The automation solution will be the video. Uh, it may be that video gets deployed in the form of some sort of robot that goes up and down a hallway. Uh, but there's so much you can do with putting a camera in a hallway. You don't really need the robot component. So that may be another way to think about that uh, that question. And with that uh, with that pithy response on robotics in our industry from Alper and I, um, I think we're going to uh, to draw this to a conclusion. We appreciate everybody's support. Um, you will get a chance to answer some survey questions about the webinar. We're very interested in getting feedback on how we should try and improve this. Uh, what kind of content you'd like to see, how we handle questions, that sort of thing. So please, please provide that information. We thank you all for your time and uh, look forward to seeing you at, uh, at various industry conferences and, and on our next webinar. So thanks, and Ron, I think we can shut her off. <laughs>